Uh, by the way, just before we get started, uh, something to make you aware of. Today actually is nine years ago today that Jonathan Sigmund came and started on ministry staff here. Yeah. So if you see him, he was actually the first person we hired on ministry staff at Calvary. And uh, we, we brought him on as youth pastor, and now he serves as executive pastor for our church family. Does such a great job. And if you get a chance to see him today, just wish him a happy anniversary. We're in a series right now called Next, and this is a, a powerful moment in time for all of our church family. And the truth is, is that we believe that with God there always is a next that we've not crossed some invisible line that disqualified us from God being able to use us in his future and in ours. And uh, today is kind of an interesting gathering point because uh, especially if you're here for the first time, you're going to get a rare insight into how our church family feels about our community around us and our, about our willingness to sacrifice for others. You're gonna see some rare insights to that today. And what I want you to know is that if this is your first time, we're not asking anything of you today. Uh, we are challenging ourselves for a significant undertaking. So you can relax and just kind of listen to how we process uh, extending God's grace even further into our world. We're in Joshua chapter 5. It's kind of an unusual story, not nearly as well known as the story of Jericho. This one actually precedes it, but without this, there would not have been a Jericho. It says, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. How many of you were walking through the woods and came across a person with a drawn sword? That would be a problem for you. This is not a video game. This is real life. And, and so this is what Joshua did. He said, he went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord of hosts, uh, of, of Lord's army, replied, Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. It's a great passage of scripture. Joshua had actually been near this spot 40 years earlier. Though some time had passed, it was a significant part of his life. Moses had selected 12 leaders to go in and gather information about the land that they intended to possess. They wanted some strategic and valuable information to know how to proceed. First of all, was the land densely populated or was it scarcely populated? Secondly, how was the produce of the land? Was, was it abundant pro produce or was there scarcity in the land? And thirdly, did they have walled and well-fortified cities or did people live in open plains? So they went to gather this information. The first place they come across is Jericho. And Jericho was a massive city. It was just unbelievably large with a huge population and impenetrable walls. When they looked at the produce around the area, it was so impressive that they were completely blown away by how much was able to grow there and how big it grew. By the way, that's still true today. But they, they actually took clusters of grapes that were so large, they had to hang them on poles between two people to carry them. Now, you've been to the grocery store and picked up a cluster of grapes. How many found a cluster so big you needed helping hands to come and help you get it? No, but that's what they had. Ten of the leaders who were with this group of, of 12, uh, they were terrified by what they saw, absolutely terrified. And they considered any effort to move into this land a suicide mission. And so they came back and they said, look, we will not survive this event. Our wives, our children, they're all going to be lost, and we need to abort this mission right now. Uh, two of the leaders came to a very different conclusion. Their names are Joshua and Caleb. And they believed that God would help them prevail in any conflict that they were going to face. Which is, this is the point in scripture and in this story where modern people have a very difficult time with the Bible, with God, and with religion. And that is, they, they get frustrated and they say, well, here's the problem. You see, God is, is having another group of people to go in to dominate another people group and destroy a culture. And, and, and I just don't think that that is appropriate. And what I would tell you is, is that 
if you actually examine the history and the passage that, this is, that talks about this, you discover that's not what's happening at all. It was not an attempt to destroy a culture. But if I began right now to tell you some of the things that those tribes in that culture were doing to the weakest among them, including children, women, if anyone managed to live to be elderly, uh, two things would happen. It would make you nauseous, and it would make you angry. And I know that because we have seen things like that on our news. Where we just look at what happens to children, and our heart breaks, and it just makes us ill. And then we get enraged. And I hear people say things like this. If there is a God and he is loving and he is powerful, how can he allow something like that to happen? And here's what I want you to know. We can't be angry at God for allowing something like that to happen and then be angry at God for doing something about it. And so Israel was going to go in and put a stop to this. Now, you have to understand, God had given lots of time. He had sent warnings to each of these tribes, and he had actually given them not weeks, not months, not years, not decades, hundreds of years to try to turn this situation around. Hundreds of years, hoping for some ray of hope that there was improvement in how they treated the very uh, smallest, the very youngest, the very weakest among them. And not only was there no improvement, it actually got worse. And there comes a moment when God just says, that's it. It has to stop. Now, on the Israelite side, Joshua is pleading with the leaders and with the nation not to disobey God because of their fear. This is a very interesting concept. Most of us think that people uh, disobey God because... Um, they're tempted to do something, they're attracted to something, or they're defiant. You know, they're just, God's not going to tell me what to do. This is a very powerful point, I think, for us to grasp this morning. Fear can cause you to do anything temptation can cause you to do. Fear can cause you to do anything temptation will cause you to do. For example, if you read through scripture or you're knowledgeable about Christianity, you know that when it comes to human sexuality, the Bible actually says that the best way for human sexuality to flourish, both in terms of how we are created and in terms of the culture that we are cultivating, that the best way is, is in a covenant of marriage. That it's not just a casual commodity thing, but it's actually a covenant where two people promise to be there for the other person for the rest of their lives and that we flourish better in that environment. And of course, we're well aware that in our culture, that, that value is not always appreciated or lived up to. And to be sure, there are people who, they'll see someone who is attractive, and they are willing to violate that value just because they are attracted or distracted by someone. But that's not the only reason. There are people who will also violate that value, not because they are attracted, but because they are afraid if they don't do what the other person wants, they will lose the relationship. See, fear can cause you to do anything that temptation will cause you to do. And it's absolutely amazing to me how many of us have never really identified what we are afraid of. What are those fears? We've never really faced them. We've never really challenged them. And so we allow these invisible and inaudible internal attacks to defeat us before any other force can. The nation of Israel retreated before they ever faced a single conflict. Now, the other piece about this is you might not know, Joshua is actually over 80 years old at the telling of this story. I know if you were in Sunday school, you probably saw a drawing of him and he looked at the prime of his life. Not so, he's over 80 years old. And at this point, he's remembering that the last time he tried to encourage people to move forward, they actually went backwards. That will cause a leader some anxiety. And as Joshua is mulling all, all this over, he looks up and he sees a man standing in the pathway of, of, of where he's walking, and he's got a drawn sword. And so Joshua, over 80-year-old Joshua, walks up to a man with a drawn sword in an attack position and challenges him. What is he thinking? And he says, you get to decide right now. This is not a spectator sport. Are you on our side or you are on their side? And the captain of the Lord's army looks at him and says, neither. It's amazing to me how often we want God 
to choose between people groups. We want God to take sides. Somebody asked me today if God was on the side of the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> and I said, if he is, he has some explaining to do. Because <laughs> that's not working so well. The Bible reveals that God doesn't choose sides. God asks us to choose him. There's a huge difference in that concept. People were always trying to get Jesus to, choo to take sides, choose us over them, choose this group of standards over that woman who has done that particular sin, choose this group over those poor, choose this group over a different ethnicity. Choose always they were asking Jesus to choose sides, and every single time he refused to take sides. He simply loved and served anyone he came in contact with. We think that God wants, we want God to choose sides between us and another religious group, between us and another group of people in our community or someplace else in the world. People are constantly thinking God's going to choose this region of the world over that region of the world or this nation over that nation. He won't do it. Ask him every time. He always says neither. He's not choosing sides. He's asking us to choose him. So immediately, Joshua just goes down on his face, a posture of submission, and he stops making demands, and he starts seeking direction, which is a really important point for us. Walking by faith requires seeking direction from God, not making demands of God. We begin to seek direction. God calls us to love him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, because... God loves us with all of his heart, with all of his mind, with all of his soul, and with all of his strength. That's God's commitment to us. Now today, interestingly enough, is Commitment Sunday for us. Our leaders have not approached God to make demands of him. Our leaders have sought direction from him. And we're at a place now as a church family where we have a decision to make. Will we choose to believe that God has a future for us that's greater than anything we've experienced up to this point? And it's easy to talk about that in terms of our church family, but let me just ask, do you believe that for yourself? Is there anything in you that thinks your best days are behind you? Or that somehow it will never happen for you? Or how about for your family? So we have asked people who are part of our church family to take a step of faith today, and that involves making a commitment that could last over the next 36 months. And it's very easy in a moment like that to be afraid. What if I don't have enough? What, what if I run out of resource? Or afraid that my gift is so insignificant it won't really make that much of a difference anyway. And here's what I want you to see. Israel was in the exact same boat. There's a phrase that they used. It's, it's referred to in Numbers, the 13th chapter, when they retold this story. This is what it tells us there. It says, in Numbers chapter 13, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. That's it. We were so insignificant when we went in to look at the land. They were like giants to us. We were like grasshoppers to them. And here's what you should know. The moment you see yourself or your gift is insignificant, the only option left is to hide what you have and hold on to what you have. That's it. You can't risk anything. You can't take any steps of faith. You just have to hang on. We are not asking God to choose Calvary Assembly today. We are seeking to choose God. I'm convinced that there's not a single person in our community that God does not love deeply, unendingly. I think he wants what's best for every single person and every single family in our community. I think he wants them to experience hope. I think he wants them to find meaning. I don't think he's embarrassed by them. I don't think he's angry with them. I think that he knows if they ever interact with grace, they will enjoy peace. They will release joy. They will reflect beauty, and they will actually find meaning. That's what happens when people's lives interact with grace. And that's what he wants for every single person in our community. God doesn't want to leave anybody out. One time on a service, 
full, full service, just about like this. I ask a group of people to come up on the stage, and I ask them to form a circle, just stand in a circle. So they did that. And then I asked one person to go on the end of the stage, and I said, your objective is to get into the middle of that circle by any means necessary. <laughs> and so the person looked at the circle, and everyone in the circle locked arms, and the battle ensued. <laughs> and eventually they broke in. And then I just said, for the record, I never asked anybody in the circle to keep anyone out. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? That's not the heart of God. The goal is not to keep anyone out, but to let anyone in. So we're not demanding anything of God today. We're seeking his direction and what he wants for our community. So I've got a couple things for you to do today. The first is, in the pocket of the seat in front of you, there's a little blank white card. It looks like this. So if you can just pull that out right now. I've got a little assignment. Just pull this white card out. And this is what I'm going to ask. This is how we're going to choose to focus on someone other than ourselves today. We're going to focus on others. And I want you to take a pen, and I want you to write the first name, and if you want, the last initial, but please don't put a last name on of someone that you would like, that you know that you would like to have them experience God's grace for themselves. People who feel broken in some way or unable to walk freely in some way or struggling with some point of provision in some way. Maybe they go around with the impression that God is just angry at them and looking for a reason to punish them and they don't know yet that God has already taken all that punishment and someone already paid that price. And because God is just, he will never demand two prices for that punishment. Just, and you can put more than one name on a card. Like maybe, you, maybe five people can, but that's, that's fine. Put as many names on that card as you want. First name, if you want, last initial. I'm just going to give you half a minute to do that. First name, last initial. I'm going to ask you to set that card aside just for a second because we're going to do something with both of these. I'm going to ask you to pull out a card that looks like this. Maybe you brought yours with you, and if you did, that's fine. You may have already completed this. This is a commitment card. Once again, if this is your first time, uh, you're under no obligation right now. And uh, by the way, uh, if you don't want to do something, you don't have to here. This is not about a, a, a trick to get you to do something you don't want. But on the back of that card, there's a place for your name. So if you can just take a moment. If you haven't done this already, just, just fill that out. And uh, for contact information, uh, if we already have that on file, you don't have to complete that. But if anything's being updated or you're not sure we have it, if you could just fill that out. And then there's an option to give a one-time gift because maybe there's something you would like to contribute. And here's, here's what I need you to know, all right? I am asking everyone who thinks and believes that they're part of our church family to do something. And this is my concern. My concern is that you will look at what you can do and you will say, it's not enough. It won't make the difference. And I have it on really good authority from Scripture that a little older widow who came in the presence of Jesus and dropped two small coins into the contribution box that day just lit all of heaven up because what seemed like a really insignificant thing to someone else Jesus knew its true value of. And so our greatest temptation is not that I've got too much and they won't know how to handle it. Our greatest temptation is I have too little and it won't make a difference. And I'm asking you to dare to trust God with your little because he can make a big difference with that. Or maybe you'd like to consider a, a along with or separate from that a 36-month commitment, just an amount every month 
uh, for my wife and I, we're, we're doing both of those options. We, we, we're giving an amount and then we're doing something over that 36 month. Or maybe there's a, an amount and a time period you want that's different than that. It might be weekly, it might be every other month, it might be 12 months instead of 36. Whatever that is, just jot that down. And then here's what we're gonna do this morning. Um, we're going to come up and if you've already, you may have already turned your card in and that's fine. And maybe you're not ready to make that commitment today. Also fine. But we all also have the names of individuals that we'd love to see transformed by God's grace. So what we're going to do is, uh, section by section, and starting from the back, we're going to have you come up and you can bring your prayer card up and there's boards up here and you just stick them on. By the way, our kids have already done this. And if you look... They have friends that they want to see experience the grace of God, too. And isn't it great that children figure that out so early in life? So just come up and you can stick your, your prayer card on the board. And then if you have a commitment card you want to leave, you can put it in the box that's underneath it. Now, while we do this, I'm just going to ask you to, to remain seated until your row is called. We are going to start from the back and work our way forward. Just remain seated until your row is called. And when you come back, just sit back down. It'll help people to be able to move. At the end, we'll all stand and worship together. But while we're doing this, let's do it in an attitude of worship. So, Father, we're asking you to help us choose you and help others. We're not trying to build a nicer place for ourselves. We're trying to create more space for people who want to know more about you. In Jesus' name.